Um, so I'm going to debate today about the frontline therapy. The best frontline therapy for patients age 60 with CLL is actually an ibrutinib-based therapy. And there's a major assumption that we're making here, and I just want to clarify that, that this patient who's age 60 is 60 and well. So we have spent a lot of time talking about age over 65, age under 65, comorbidity, SEER scores, creatinine clearances. And these are all things that have sort of entered into what's become our approval pathway. And I think it's important to keep in mind for this debate that we are talking about just someone who's fit. But what I do want everyone to take home with them today is that everything that I say now, which is very applicable, actually even more applicable to the patient who's over age 65 or unfit, really should be applied to the fit patient under the age of 65. And I think that's very, very important. Because the patients who are young, they're the ones who have the most to lose by making a mistake. And I think that's a very important thing that often gets forgotten. So we've all seen this slide, and it's actually, uh, I didn't realize that it was an adaptation of Jim Brown's slide. This slide has been adapted from so many different people. But the uh, evolution of therapies over time really has dramatically changed. And what really is most important is we've gone to extremely high CR and overall response rates, but no one's focusing on long-term survival. No one's focusing on overall survival. And that really is what's most important to our patients. So I'm not interested in my patients getting CRs unless it translates into a better overall survival. And we have that data for FC and FCR from the, and fludarabine-based chemotherapies in general from the CLL4, the eight study, and a lot of the MD Anderson data. But what I really want to point out is the role of MRD, okay, using that as the extreme example of CR, is really meaningless when we're talking about B-cell receptor antagonists. And I want everyone to remember this. So we take a patient who's gotten six cycles of FCR chemotherapy, and at two months after their last cycle of FCR chemotherapy, they are MRD negative. Now we know, unless they're mutated, and one of those 30%, not 40%, I like how you added 10% there at the end. But if they're one of those 30% who are going to have long-term cure, if they're not one of those 30%, they're going to relapse. So somewhere in them is more CLL. Now, I wouldn't be surprised if we took that person, MRD negative, two months post six cycles of FCR, and gave them ibrutinib, that we would make them MRD positive. Remember, ibrutinib and all B-cell receptor antagonists give the cells a predilection to circulate. And so the question is, though, is that a bad thing? We took our MRD negative patient and made them positive. And I don't think that's a bad thing, but I think that we have to revise what we're looking at. And that's why there's a big question mark here about CRs, because we're really looking at responses. And we've already revised our response criteria to include the PR with lymphocytosis, thank you, Dr. Chesson, and we will now need to really keep a close eye on what's going to happen with the CRs. So here's a general curve from MD Anderson looking at all their CLL patients by decade, and you can certainly think that we are doing better. As you see, the patients from the 2000 to 2010 decade certainly look like they're having a markedly improved overall survival. But what's really important, and these are actually data from a European study that's separate, is that there really has been a huge lead time bias. And what we're really doing is just diagnosing patients much earlier. All right, so you can see in the 1970s, only 26% of patients were diagnosed, 26% um, of the patients who were diagnosed were Binet stage A. But here we are in the 1990s when it was 72%. And that's really responsible for all of the benefits that we've seen decade to decade, with the exception of maybe some improvement in Binet stage C patients, arguably because of better um, supportive therapies. We are going to show a lot of the same slides. And here we are looking at the FCR 300. So these are 300 patients treated at MD Anderson. And they were treated over a very long period of time, but ostensibly they were all treated with a a rather similar treatment. And what you can see here is the curve that we always talk about of the PFS, that perhaps we do have a group of cured patients. So this is actually the 30% the mark. And that third of patients 
Are they cured? Perhaps, we don't know. But what's really more important is this group is very overly represented by mutated immunoglobulin gene patients. And so the question really is, are these the patients that we really even needed to cure? I mean, these patients who have very, very long time to initial treatment, when they get treated, they obviously have a very long time to their next treatment. So I don't think this really serves us any help in looking at it. And what you can see here is that, yes, in the mutated population, you're now up to a 60% long-term outcome. But in the unmutated, more aggressive diseases, we're down to 10%. So going back to that previous slide, 74% of those long-term survivors were mutated patients. And so the question really is, do we really need to use such aggressive therapy to get those patients out that far? And is that really an advantage to a group of patients who aren't that aggressive? And what I want everyone to keep in mind is the number of patients that we had to sacrifice from mild dysplasia, from infections, in order to help that 30%. So the other problem, of course, is that when patients get treated with FCR, they relapse 70% of the time. And when they relapse, often they're unable to get additional therapies. Their CLL itself is often uh, refractory and not responsive to additional therapies. And so what we look at here is when we look at overall survival from progression in these patients, we're talking about a median of 51 months. So you give the patient FCR chemotherapy, and when they progress, it's really just 51 months that they have left. And so if you're talking about someone who, you know, ostensibly is older and looking forward to just, you know, 10 years from their date of first therapy to have a lifespan, that's one thing. But if we're talking about a young patient who's 60 years old, our hope is that he can actually make it to 90 or even 105. And then this is the other major thing that we have to look at. So secondary myeloid neoplasias, all right? So these are data from the ECOG study led by Mitch Smith, which really showed that there was an 8.2% cumulative incidence in secondary AML and MDS, so treatment-related myeloid neoplasia, so TMN is what it was called in the study, out at seven years with fludarabine plus cyclophosphamide as compared to 4.6% with fludarabine alone. So it's still significant with fludarabine alone, but of course it's almost twice higher with the combination. And you'll see here that seven out of the nine patients actually received no additional therapy beyond the initial FC chemotherapy that they received. And then, of course, here's data from MD Anderson itself, where they actually have an 8% risk of AML or MDS after receiving FCR chemotherapy. And that's 8% compared to only 1% in patients who received non-genotoxic therapies. And yes, of course, this is not a randomized controlled study, and the patients might have gotten non-genotoxic therapy because they were infirm and didn't have the longevity of the other patients, but this certainly is a very significant difference. What I'd also like to point out is that there's a difference in Richter's transformations as well. We do need to sort of sort out whether or not Richter's is a time-based or if it's a chromosomal-based or if it's going to be a... Um, prior treatment related, um, you know, if it's going to be re related to prior treatment, time of disease, or uh, just other factors that are the nature of the biology of the CLL itself. So these are all very important reasons to avoid chemotherapy, and included in this is just the overall statement from Mike Keating that 40% of deaths of CLL patients are associated with second solid tumors acute leukemias, MDS, or Richter's transformations. And this includes 71% of those deaths being in patients in first remission. So let's talk about B-cell receptor antagonists, more specifically ibrutinib. We really have a tremendous array of agents that are moving forward, and it's becoming very quickly an alphabet soup. What I really want to emphasize to everyone is, while this is a very nice, neat picture, it's certainly not representative of what really goes on. And so anytime someone tells you that this is how one of these things work, we're really just kidding ourselves. So looking at the phase two trial with ibrutinib, and this was a very early phase two trial that was done looking at patients who are relapse refractory or treatment naive over the age of 65. 
And these data, what's important to keep in mind, are constantly evolving. So an entity of PR with lymphocytosis was created. For those patients who are having a response, whose lymph nodes have been reduced by more than 50 percent, but yet they still have a lymphocytosis and would otherwise qualify as having progressive disease. So we actually call them some, we traditionally call them progressive. In the old days, we might have called them actually as PD. More acutely, we, or more recently, we're calling them a stable disease, and now we're calling them PR with lymphocytosis. So when you look, there's a huge number of patients who evolve from PR with lymphocytosis to PR. And there's actually also a large number of patients who progress from, who go from PR to CR. And these data are going to continue to emerge over time. So you really can't look at the CR rates. And I think that's very pertinent, especially when dealing with someone who's talking about MRDs and CRs as the endpoints. Because for what we're dealing with today with these agents, that's not helpful. But overall, looking at PR with lymphocytosis, PRs and CRs, you can see here we're talking about an 84 percent response rate in treatment naive and 88 percent in relapsed refractory. And when we look out at 30 months um, progression-free survival, you can see these numbers are very, very high. And what I'd like to point out, you can see here 96 percent and 69 percent. Um, and I'm going to address some of the reasons why there's a difference between these two groups in a moment. But what I really want you to point out is, yes, there are, you know, the numbers of patients are small, but there really are a large number of patients out beyond 30 months in the vast majority. And what I would like to point out that this one person at month eight was a Richter's transformation, arguably someone who should never have been on the study. But we've all looked at these patients who are masses of lymphadenopathy. You treat them with something, the lymphadenopathy goes away, and all of a sudden you see that Richter's lymph node growing. So, you know, I certainly am not going to blame that on the drug. So with this one exception, we're really talking about a straight line. And we're talking about a straight line that's at a median PFS of 30 months. So we're not even talking about something that's beginning to fall down to the median. Now, looking at the outcome here for patients in general, we have basically one patient who came off for disease progression in the treatment naive arm and 10 patients in the relapse refractory arm. Seven of these patients are for Richter's. So we know that ibrutinib works very effectively at controlling CLL. We even have some data now that if patients have CLL and respond and progress with CLL, that there are some very specific genetic mutations that might be responsible for those changes. But we do know that ibrutinib doesn't control the Richter's. And so the vast majority of these people that are representing the, the ticks down on the curve are really Richter's transformations. And what I want to show you here is looking at a group, we started off with 246 total patients treated with ibrutinib, found 150 patients who were treated more than 12 months, 20 of whom had disease progression, 13 were Richter's. We actually looked at the remaining seven, and we found five of them with these single base parent mutations. All right, and so the two that we saw was one was a assisting the serine change at um, amino acid residue 41 in BTK, and then the other one was here in PLC gamma that led up to an upregulation of uh, PLC gamma and bypassed the inhibition of BTK. This change here actually just impaired the ability of ibrutinib to bind to BTK itself. And when you look, these mutations develop predominantly in those patients who have complex karyotype 17p deleted or 11q deleted um, abnormalities. So the people who arguably have genomic instability. And the most common cause of genomic instability is going to be chemotherapy. So ostensibly, if we take these drugs and if we give patients ibrutinib first and never expose them to the FCR chemotherapy, we would hopefully be able to generate a, popula patient, a population of patients who won't have the genomic instability and who will actually continue on um, ibrutinib indefinitely. Thank you.